Volkswagen CEO Martin Winterkorn steps down after the company admits to rigging emission tests in the United States. A defiant Winterkorn says he did nothing wrong but will take responsibility. Global manufacturing growth, if you look at it today, has virtually come to a standstill. Now, these are typical indicators that you get of a global economy that's very weak and is teetering on the brink of a recession. China's slowdown has put the world in the throes of a recession, says Morgan Stanley's Richard Sharma. Shares in Shanghai plunge as manufacturing PMI plunges to the lowest level in over six years. The economy and markets will remain stable, says the country's President Xi Jinping in an address to the United States, promises that China will not shut its doors to foreign companies, nor will it devalue its currency further. A late recovery lifts spirits on the Lao Street. Nifty defends 7,800. Sensex jumps over 170 points. Bank stocks lead right from the front. It's spirituality over business for the co-founder of Fortis Healthcare. Shivinder Singh, the billionaire, quits as executive vice chairman to take up full-time seva at a spiritual organization. Prime Minister Modi meets his Irish counterpart in Dublin, pushes for easier visa norms for Indian IT companies and the island nation support for India's claim to be made a permanent member of the UN Security Council. This is the first visit by an Indian head of state to Ireland in 60 years. He's going to try and entice them to invest more and more into India. Hard sell his uh, flagship scheme of Make in India and Skill India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's forthcoming visit to San Francisco and the Bay Area. A geographical and perhaps mental space more popularly known as Silicon Valley is the talking point. Bye-bye Dublin. Hello New York. Prime Minister Modi is all set for his five-day visit to the United States. Special ground reports coming up. We'll get to a candid chat with the first Air Chief Marshal of the Indian Air Force, Arjun Singh, on the 1964 war. <laughs> India rich list is out. No change in the top three with Mukesh Ambani, Dilip Sangvi, Nazim Premji holding on to their positions. But a lot of changes in the top 10 and the top 100 with 12 new entrants, most notable of them Sachin and Bini Bansal of Flipkart are India's first e commerce billionaires. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. Hi, Nantha. Good evening, Shireen. And you know what? Number 67 on that list is Shivinder Mohan Singh, and he has decided to give it all up. The co founder of Fortis is just chosen spirituality over business and he's decided to take up full-time seva. Well, that is right. That's an unusual story, but first is a breaking story at this hour. The emission scandal at Volkswagen has claimed its first casualty. The CEO of the German automaker, Martin Winterkorn, has been ousted or he's decided to step down. The move comes after a marathon board meeting at the company's headquarters in Wolfsburg. Winterkorn maintains that he did nothing wrong, but has decided to take responsibility for the situation. CNBC's uh, European and US team now join us with the latest developments in the Volkswagen saga. Guys. Uh, Martin Winterkorn stepping down. Uh, Winterkorn uh, having been in his position for decades. Volkswagen is saying that they'll be meeting with the full supervisory board on Friday. And Matt, they're also talking about how they're going to be launching an investigation. They'll be meeting all efforts to uh, restore trust. They say it will take time, but they're going to make efforts to restore trust. Bob, some of the other comments also saying uh, that the, the events, they have to be cleared up. They need to start afresh, and, and they have to work with their customers to, to restore trust. I mean, it's a big mouthful for whoever it is that takes this position on now. Yeah, huge, huge thing. I mean, obviously, that's, you have to start at this level. 
Um, the manager has made it clear they're going to be, well, we hope, honest and clear about what's happened and the investigation will reveal all. I think maybe there's a lot more to be revealed yet. Um, I note, for example, that of the 11 million diesels involved, not all of them were sold just in the US, they were sold globally. So this is not just going to stay in the US, it's going to spread elsewhere. And we still don't know, really, whether this was just Volkswagen, one of the most technologically advanced auto companies in the world that had this particular piece of defeat device software or whether it's something that other manufacturers might have been looking at. Mm. I mean, a lot of people still wondering why a company like Volkswagen yeah. would have to do something like yeah. this or would choose to do something like this. That they're, they're, they're the largest company in Europe. They have a solid trust or had a solid trust base from, from customers, from investors. Also, the stock held very widely by yeah. uh, not, not just retail investors, but large institutions as well. I mean, how do you restore trust in a company like this? And, 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 and do you get in or do you stay out for the time being? Uh, well, uh, t first question is how do you restore trust? I think, well, uh, the first thing is to be honest and say that, that this was, as the management has done, to say this was deliberate, that the top management has to take uh, the consequences yeah. of that. That's the first thing. The second thing is to tell us exactly what, how this happened. Is there something particular about US emission standards that uh, pushed uh, a company in very intense competition in the States from every manufacturer in the States yeah. trying to get a share of the market is very intense and that's maybe pressured some people into doing this sort of thing. Matt, um, I was speaking to my guests about this yesterday. Do you think that there's a that there, we now have to go through a, 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 a turn of the cards with regards to diesel? Is, is diesel dead now? Uh, I, I believe it will hasten its, uh, the shift away from it more towards hybrids. Um, even in Europe, uh, you're looking at urban areas uh, that want to ban diesels because of the particulate matter that they emit. And, and certainly the NOx standards get tighter and tighter and tighter, and that's one of the reasons why you're seeing these after-treatment systems like the AdBlue, which VW didn't put on these vehicles, and, and that was primarily for a cost reason, and why they did the defeat thing was to make the cars competitive in the marketplace. You'll see that it's going to get too expensive to actually uh, to build clean diesels. And, uh, and the move towards hy hybridization and electrification has already begun. And it's, going to, it's only going to accelerate from here because of this. So that is the latest as far as the Volkswagen fiasco is concerned. The CEO has been ousted and of course they have not announced what the interim uh, replacement is likely to be or whether they will put in a succession plan in place shortly or not. There are details awaited on that. We will of course continue to track that story closely. But the other big story this evening, China's economic slowdown is only worsening and Morgan Stanley's Ritesh Sharma is warned of an impending global recession. The latest preliminary market purchasing managers in index or PMI for September has come in at a six-year low of 47 versus expectations of 47.5. Almost all categories including employment, new orders and output came in below the reading in August while a deflationary trend continues at both the input and factory gates. Meanwhile, Asian stocks lost their footing on the back of the renewed China jitters. The Japanese Nikkei was closed for the third day today on account of a public holiday but the rest of Asia losing about 2% of peace. And here's what Morgan Stanley's Ruchi Sharma, the author of Breakout Nations, has had to say he's in fact been reiterating this for a while. He believes the global economy is close to a recession. Speaking to CNBC, Sharma warned the slowdown in China will have drastic consequences for the rest of the world. China has been the largest contributor to global growth uh, this decade. And if you look at the trends in Asia, Asia is already in a trade recession. Export growth in virtually every Asian country is collapsing and the manufacturing growth as we know that the big story of the last couple of decades has been that China has become the hub of global manufacturing and global manufacturing growth if you look at it today has virtually come to a standstill now these are typical indicators that you get of a global economy that's very weak and is teetering on the brink of a recession so I think that we already have some signposts here that the global economy is pretty much close to a recession and in that article that I wrote I think we are, mm -hmm. we are one shock away from the global economy entering its sixth global recession in post-war history. That's a word of caution coming in from Richard Sharma, rather a warning saying the world could slip into recession if the Chinese economy doesn't pick up. China's President Xi Jinping has defended his country's growth pace in the first policy address in the United States where he landed last night. 
Jinping reassured the world that China's financial markets would remain stable. He added, China is not going to lower the exchange rate to boost exports and attempt to push fears of an Asian currency war after the surprise devaluation in the month of August. Here's Yonis Yoon reporting from Beijing on the response to Jinping's address in Seattle. Uh, when the Chinese president was making these uh, was making his address, uh, you could tell that he was focusing on the issues that investors have been most concerned about: uh, cons uh, growth here in China as well as uh, market reform. Uh, he addressed both of those issues, and uh, that's because uh, of the uh, growing pressure that he faces outside uh, by, say, the Federal Reserve uh, saying that China was was one key risk, and and we could it, it, it appears that the authorities. Uh, Authorities here are much more disturbed these days by the fact that the Chinese economy is being considered a source of risk. And so we've been hearing many more strong statements by uh, the Chinese president or the premier recently about how the economy here is strong, that they're in control, that they're still uh, are going to embrace these market reforms, that they're going to make sure that the currency as well as the, the uh, markets here are not going to face a lot of st instability. However, um, um, the, the problem is that um, the question is, is, is whether or not uh, the credibility that they've lost is going to be restored in the eyes of many of these investors. You know, soon they're reporting on Xi Jinping's address in Seattle. Uh, the Chinese Premier, they're very categorically stating that the Chinese economy is not doing as badly as people fear or imagine. Also stating that China will not indulge in a currency battle. Now, after a major sell-off yesterday, markets opened with steep losses again today. And it was looking downhill before we saw a dramatic turnaround in late trade. So the Nifty finally tumbling below 7,800 during the morning managed to recover and defend that level. The Sensex also ended with gains of about 170 points. As you can see, the market's moving higher towards the end of trade. The mid caps also rose in tandem with the blue chips with the index gaining about 80 points. Anuj joins us now to wrap up the day's trading action. Anuj, India has managed to buck the trend across Asia today. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the start was pretty bad. It looked like the market was breaking down and the Nifty would even go below 7,700. And then finally, the market had a sharp recovery and at one point towards closing, the Nifty was testing 7,900. But then, this is expiry week. You should be uh, expecting these kind of moves uh, uh, ahead of expiry and a day ahead of expiry. Really, that was a bizarre move that you saw. Uh, the recovery was led by banks, as you would expect, the, the largest sector contributing clearly. ITC, Infosys, and some commodity stocks also supported. So let's talk about some of the stocks that led the market recovery. As I said, it was about private sector banks, uh, uh, where, where we saw the, the highest amount of recovery. So stocks like Indusin Bank, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, Kota, KS Bank, all of them were higher in trade. Apart from that, uh, the support for the market came from two or three heavyweights. ITC in particular was strong through the day. That stock was up about 1.5%, Infosys nearly a percent, and Lupin was up about 3%. Commodity stocks, some of them gained today. Stocks like Ken, that was up about 4.5%, was the top nifty gainer actually. Vedanta was up 3%, and Coal India saw some short covering after the big decline of last few days. In terms of nifty losers, NMDC was the top loser today, down about 4%. Tata Motors has now halved, exactly halved, from its 52-week highs. That stock was down 2%. And Bosch, that stock was down about close to 3%. In terms of mid-cap, stock of the day today was Dishman Pharma. That stock was up about 16%. It's already seen a fair bit of re-rating, but that continues. And actually, even IDBA Bank can claim to be one of the stocks of the day. That was also up 9%, and India Bulls Housing Finance was up 4.5%. Some more names then, JP Associates, Mercator, Trident, all of these stocks up between 10 to 12 percent. So, all in all, a good day. Tomorrow is expiry, and that's going to be a big day. If the market has shown enough volatility uh, over yesterday and today, and the sense you get is that that's going to continue on the expiry day. Well, it is expiry, so let's see how the markets do. And I appreciate you joining us with the details. A quick check of action on Wall Street. All three major indices are trading in the red at the moment. With minor cuts, though, that's the S&P for you. The Dow has now lost about half a percent, so the Nasdaq is trading flat across the Atlantic. European markets finished slightly higher today as investors got to grips with the latest in the Volkswagen emissions scandal. So the news is at least out of the way about the CEO and the replacement there. Of course, there's uh, likely to be many new developments in that story. But that's the FTSE for you. 
percent and a half higher, and the CAC car closing flat. The DAX down by about uh, higher by about half a percent. Crude, crude prices moving higher. Both Brent and NYMEX are trading largely flat for now, though about a percent and a half lower on the NYMEX and Brent now at 49.21 higher by about half a percent or so. Well, staying with that space, the Indian government's refusal to join an arbitration to try and resolve the more than 10,000 crore rupee tax dispute has not gone down well with Kane PLC. The company has now approached an international court of justice in The Hague. Nantara, this was expected. The notice period has expired. The government has not appointed an arbitrator. The government is looking at some sort of mechanism to try and resolve these legacy cases. When and how that happens is a different story. But for the moment, Kane NPLC doing what it's entitled to do, which is move the Hague. That's right. Six months the time that was given to the Indian government, and that's as per the treaty that we have with the United Kingdom. Uh, so since the government didn't do that, Kain Energy PLC deciding to go to the International Court of Justice at Hague when it had served the uh, notice at the first time to the Indian government, it had appointed its arbitrator, Foreign Minister, uh, hailing from Hungary. You know, a lot riding here. It's not just a 10,000 crore rupee dispute. The fact is, Kain Energy can't even exist it with one share that it holds in Kane India, and that's about 10% plus that it holds in Kane India. Kane Energy is also suing the government for about $600 million, saying how uh, you know market value of Kane India has gone down ever since these tax notices had been issued to all the stakeholders involved. And plus, you have a Vedanta Kane India merger that is being proposed, which cannot go through unless Kane Energy actually agrees to it. It's the largest minority shareholder. And, you know, sources indicating how can Kane Energy agree to that merger, agree to the valuations uh, decided by the boards of Kane India and Vedanta, when on the other hand, it's suing the government saying we've lost va market value in this company. So a lot riding on this arbitration besides just the image of India. The, it be, being an investment destination. And I like to just on a parting note, Shireen, say, you know, Kane India, yes, it's an old tax case, but it's not as old as, let's say, Vodafone. You know, that's a much larger disputed amount. It was one of the first ones to serve and notice to the Indian government, and those arbitration proceedings still haven't begun. All right, so let's see which uh, way this actually heads. And as we've been pointing out, the finance minister is saying that the government is seized at the matter. They want to address this just as they did with FIA and the MAT issue. Perhaps send it to a judicial committee, perhaps send it to the Justice Shah panel, but let's see where this heads. Now, it's a first in over 60 years. The Indian Prime Minister is in the island nation of Ireland today before he heads towards the U.S., where he lands tomorrow morning, our time. His visit to Ireland may be more or less than 24 hours, about 24 hours, actually not even. He, didn't, he did hold bilateral talks with his Irish counterpart. And while both nations uh, talked about some of the shared traditions, Prime Minister Modi used the opportunity to push for some of India's objectives, that of an easier visa regime for Indian IT companies and Ireland support for India's elevation in the UN Security Council. I hope that our joint working group of information technology will meet soon to chart out the roadmap for collaboration. I also hope that Ireland's visa policy will be sensitive to the requirements of India's information technology firms. I thought Ireland's support for the reforms of the UN Security Council within the fixed time frame, in particular for successful conclusion of intergovernmental negotiations in the 70th year of the United Nations. I also thought his support for India's permanent membership of the Reform Security Council. Well, that's Prime Minister Modi in Dublin, and he will now be headed to New York, which will be the next stop. He's scheduled to meet top business leaders in the U.S. and also visit Silicon Valley. Pallavi Ghosh reports from outside the world of Astoria in New York, where the Prime Minister is going to be staying. Well, the most biggest and the largest and the most prestigious hotel, that's Waldorf, which of course is going to be seeing several important heads of state, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi. But what's really going to stand out of this huge meeting of the Prime Minister is his stress on trade and business ties. Apart from the mega meeting he's planning with the Silicon Valley, a first again by the Prime Minister in a long, long time, Prime Minister Modi, of course, will be meeting the Fortune 500 company CEOs. He's going to try and entice them to invest more and more into India. Heart sell his uh, flagship scheme of Make in India and Skill India. What he's going to try and reassure to them that despite whatever the delay may be taking place, India's reform agenda under his government is very much 
on track. That's going to be an important, powerful message, which of course he's going to be uh, sending across. But apart from that, of course, it's going to be his crucial, important bilateral with President Obama. Will the Pakistan issue come up? Will that important uh, photo op handshake really take place with Nawaz Sharif? All those details will, of course, be brought to you from the Prime Minister's hotel. Well, if we go reporting from New York City. Now, many believe that Silicon Valley has the potential to build the strong foundation that India needs to transform into an innovation-led digital economy. And ahead of Modi's U.S. visit, he will also be going to Silicon Valley. Anubhav Bhosle caught up with some of the finest minds there to get a sense of how they viewed the Modi performance in the last one and a half years. And they also discussed the possible actionable agenda the Prime Minister must come up with. I think there's a building of a momentum. And, um, you know, the Prime Minister had to uh, dig out from a lot of years of uh, different um, issues and a lot of uh, different perspectives that had sort of accumulated, if you will, in the prior government. So I think he's building momentum. It takes time. He's trying to create some predictability. He's trying to create excitement. Uh, he's trying to institute reform. And we're seeing some of that movement. And I think his trip coming out here uh, to the United States, in particular the Silicon Valley, is testament to that. Mm -hmm. Would you agree it's sort of work in progress? No one expected the Prime Minister to solve it all in a year and a half. But are you seeing any signs of that? There's been a slight opening of the defense sector. Mr. Suresh Prabhu seems to be doing decent work as far as the railways is concerned. Are you seeing any signs sitting here? I think I'm cautiously optimistic. I think the current government, um, there are a lot of announcements. I mean, they're making progress mm -hmm. for sure. There are a lot of announcements, and my concern really is whether those announcements lead to, if they don't follow up, uh, to frustration uh, mm -hmm. by foreign investors. And uh, I think talking about moving from uh, red tape to red carpet, I would rather see no carpet at all. I mean, most of the countries that we operate in uh, don't necessarily have any special tax incentives or any special uh, incentives at all. Mm -hmm. The government basically just gets out of the way and lets the private sector make the investment. From red tape to red carpet, I'm presuming many of you actually don't want the red carpet. It's not as if you want the red carpet. You possibly, all that you need is a kind of an enabling environment. Exactly. I think the Prime Minister's set the right tone at the top, mm -hmm. and I think that he's um, driven a lot of energy into the markets. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, but I think that um, what's positive has been that I think he's enabled an environment where people can ask questions. Uh, there appears to be more accountability. Mm. Uh, but, I, but I also believe that the sort of the, while the tone at the top is, is the right one, the middle government and sectors below them, uh, there isn't much clarity around the interpretation of the law, whether mm. it's tax or investment. Mm. And I think that's where entrepreneurs like us who perhaps want to invest in a country like that uh, want to see the playing field. What would it actually take to make in India? I mean, uh, is it just a campaign currently? Well, I think with Silicon Valley, it's different. The Make India campaign may not be physical goods. Sure. It could be very well be software and intellectual property. But I'm, so I'm we, presuming sometimes the same rules apply. Right. Sometimes the same rules apply. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there for Indian Americans, especially in the Bay Area, to really work with India in a partnership mode, to, to invest in India and the innovation and disruption that we can bring here can be brought to India as well. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Does someone do business in India? I know you don't do business in India, but how can India actually get business ready in that sense? I think there are two things that <clears throat> we need to focus on or the government needs to focus on is infrastructure and governance. If they just do that, then I think investments will come. Capital is looking for returns and capital will flow. So, uh, and India has probably one of the best educational systems in the country. Uh, witness all the, the uh, people who leave India and go anywhere in the world, they seem to do extremely well. So now what we have to do is to keep them in India mm. and get them to build a, uh, the kind of companies that they're helping build in Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, etc. Well, that's some of the finest minds in Silicon Valley with their agenda for Prime Minister Modi. And through this week, you'll get all the action live from New York City and San Francisco right here on CNBC TV 18. Moving on, Telenor Group's wholly owned subsidiary, Uninor, is set for a brand makeover. The telecom company will now be known as Telenor India. CNBC TV 18's Prerna Barra spoke with the top management at Telenor on this repositioning strategy.
and it says affordable in the mass market and 4G aspirations. I'm at the headquarters of Telerings Communications in Gurgaon. Having seen cancellations of its telecom licenses by the Supreme Court of India, a bitter divorce being fought between the joint venture partner and a transition into becoming a 100% FDI-funded telecom operator, Uninor is set to receive a brand makeover. Uninor will now be known as Telenor India. The transition from Uninor to Telenor will mean providing more value to its existing subscriber base while retaining its Sabse Sasta strategy in the mass market of voice and internet. Telenor India's chief marketing officer, who is spearheading the rebranding exercise, says the repositioning will reinforce its pricing strategy. We have been known as a brand which stands for affordability. So when we will change from Uninor to Telenor, our core of affordability will remain intact. However, we will bring new products and services where customers will be able to seek more value every time he is transacting with Telenor as a brand. Predominantly a 2G player in six circles in India, Telenor India has been focused on pure voice and basic internet. Telenor is also not looking at jumping onto the 4G bandwagon anytime soon and is also in no hurry to offer postpaid connections to its customers as it says that 95% of mobile users in India are prepaid users. The telco is however working towards building network capabilities for high-speed data. We would need more spectrum which we need to find an answer and we are actively exploring the solution on that. However, in the meantime, I don't think the position we have in the mass market is going to immediately transform into 4G. So there is still a space, there is still an opportunity there. So we will continue to focus on what we are doing. There is no urgency for us uh, to still follow what the others are doing. We mm -hmm. still find a way to get into the market. With the government paving the way for spectrum sharing and trading, the company is now exploring options to partner with other telecom operators for 2G spectrum. We are in active discussion whether it's on trading mm -hmm. or whether preparing ourselves for the next auction. Mm -hmm. But I think trading is something which we would be interested in. So it's just not video con. I mean, we've been having discussions with uh, others also in terms of what are the uh, trading options. In the backdrop of a national furor on call drops, Telenor has already been compensating its customers for every call dropped. Unlike its players, it believes that it is the operator's obligation to compensate customers. With the rebranding of Uninor to Telenor, the company will continue to maintain its USP as being Sabse Sasta versus its peers, while the Telenor group is committed to India and will continue to offer basic voice and data services to its mass market consumers. It will wait for the 4G ecosystem to be mature before taking the plunge. In New Delhi with Prerna Barwa, this is Shireen Bhan. Well, it's an unusual move and one that's quite rare in corporate India. Portis Healthcare's co-founder and executive vice chairman Shivinder Mohan Singh today announced his intention of quitting the top job to pursue his personal spiritual journey. Singh has decided to give up the boardroom for community service at an Amritsar-based spiritual organization. Archana Shukla gets you the story. The 63rd richest Indian on the Forbes list and a leading name in the Indian healthcare sector. It's rare to see a billionaire quit at the peak, but that's exactly what 43-year-old Shivinder Mohan Singh, co-founder of Fortis Healthcare, has decided to do. He is giving up the corporate life for pursuit of spirituality by relinquishing his responsibilities as executive vice chairman at the hospital chain from January 1, 2016. Singh plans to devote his entire time to seva at the Radha Swami Satsang Vyas, a spiritual organization based in Punjab. To me, I think the personal journey took us uh, uh, into healthcare. I've been involved in it for over two decades now. Uh, and I find a lot of linkage between the two. At the end of the day, what we do in Fortis is actually serving patients who come to us at a time of their need. Uh, the only difference between uh, this service that we do at Fortis and what I would like to do going forward uh, is technically without the rewards and recognition and go along with the corporate role. And I believe it's the right time uh, for doing uh, something that I want to do for myself after having done what I thought was right for Fortis. 
The Singh brothers' combined 71.3% stake in Fortis Healthcare is currently valued at over 5,600 crore rupees. Their 51% holding in Religare Enterprises is worth almost 2,700 crores. The journey from pharmaceuticals to healthcare and financial services has been a long one, with the biggest milestone being the sale of the family's once flagship Ranbaxi Laboratories to Japanese major Taichi Sankyo. A transaction that continued to hit headlines long after it was sealed, courtesy the long and troubled road to recovery, which was fraught with allegations of information cover-up and even quality malpractices at the pharma company. But Ranbaxi is the past. The Singh brothers have spent the last several years building the hospital business at Fortis, with Shivinder Singh playing a key role. With Singh now set to exit, the company is bringing back Bhavdeep Singh as CEO, an old hand who was heading the hospital chain between 2009 and 2011. It's just that he's not going to be sitting here in the executive capacity. He is very much carrying on as a non-executive vice chairman on the board. Uh, every, you know, we jointly own the businesses together. We've done it together. While Shivinder Mohan Singh gets ready for his spiritual journey, his exit is under careful scrutiny. For a group that has aggressively expanded through m and could the departure of the co-founder be a sign of things to come? Shareholders as well as the healthcare industry are waiting for that answer to emerge. In Mumbai, Achna Shukla. Well, when are you coming to Satsang Bias next is the question Chivinder Mohan Singh asked his brother Malvinder Mohan Singh. He said, well, I'll let you know. So for, at least for now, he stays on as chairman. Unusual development there, but uh, saying that that's what he planned to do when he turns 40. A time for us to slip into a short break. Before that, the popular American television series House of Cards doesn't showcase China in any great light, but that didn't stop Chinese President Xi Jinping from referring to the show during his address at Seattle earlier today. Let's take a look and then we're back in two. In our vigorous campaign against corruption, we have punished both tigers and flies, corrupt officials irrespective of ranking in response to our people's demand. This has nothing to do with power struggle. In this case, there is no house of cards.